everyone. My name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all today. I'm going to start with a question. Did anyone have kink being a trending Twitter topic on Christmas Eve on their bingo card for this year? Because I know I sure didn't. I came back from a semi-internet break over the holidays and I felt like I was living out that one community meme where Troy comes back with pizzas and walks into everything being on fire. This is not the first time that BDSM has been hotly debated online by people who scarcely know anything about it, but I haven't seen it have quite this level of staying power before. Unlike previous times where maybe it was one or two controversial tweets, this just kept going for days. I'm not kidding. My Twitter feed for almost a week was between 90 and 50% people discussing this topic. It went so far outside the usual niche corner of kink Twitter that drill of all people was tweeting about it. Yes, that drill, one of the best Twitter accounts of all time. I'm not sure if I should die of shock, embarrassment, or both. Currently, I'm gonna go with both, but what realm of BDSM made people so stirred up that they spent their entire Christmas break debating about it? I'll give you a second to guess. Well, it was CNC, of course. A few months ago, I covered a viral Reddit post about a CNC scene gone wrong, so it's certainly in the public awareness. I've also talked about the way kink is represented on social media sites like TikTok and how people are prone to both kink shaming and somewhat vanilla shaming these days. One side will go, the things I do will occupy your boyfriend's mind long after we've broken up because I'm so kinky and devious and special. And the other side will yell back, well, at least I'm not a sick freak who needs to put my genitals in a mousetrap just to feel something. You can imagine how productive those conversations are. Not very. So really, it was only a matter of time before this dialogue oozed its way onto the increasingly polarized Twitter, I mean X, landscape. Early in the morning on Christmas Eve, someone dropped this post with the caption, quote, Again, since some of you keep defending CNC as a healthy coping machine, and then they followed that up by what seems to be a screenshot from a Tumblr post of someone verbalizing what I can only describe as the guilt-ridden thoughts that plague nearly every sadist I've ever met. Uh, yeah, the disgust here is palpable. Naturally, folks with all sizes of accounts leaped in to make their usual defenses. But it's consensual. But what if they both want it? What about gay or queer kink relationships? What about when it's the woman who's doing the topping? You see, your whole argument completely falls apart as soon as you realize not all kinky dynamics are cis hat with a male dom and a female sub. And so began days days of trench warfare with all of the usual retorts. Women only believe they are into this because of social conditioning and pressure from prawn sick men. Gay and queer people being into this is really just internalized homo or transphobia and or misogyny on top. Women topping doesn't exist outside the pressure of the male gaze and they're mostly doing it in a way that still conforms to prioritizing male pleasure rather than their own. And you add in a good dose of shaming and faux concern for women who engage in pro-doming as a profession, and this is about as good a summary of the verbal battles that took place over the next few days as I can manage. But you all have probably heard this before. You don't actually need me to trot out all of the usual arguments and responses. I kind of just did that. You don't need me to tell you for the 500th time on this channel that consent is paramount above everything else. Most of you watching probably already agree with me. Instead, I want to do something different. I hope I can expand on the superficial points I just gave and approach this from a different direction. 
I want to show you on a deeper level where these misunderstandings are coming from. I want to correct them if I can and offer some more comprehensive rebuttals that go beyond, but what if she wants it? And I also want to peel back the curtain and show how this worldview goes well beyond just policing people's individual participation in a single kink. And it's worth noting, just for the sake of establishing a timeline here, that there were several other very large tweets surrounding this topic that were made in the days following the original post. And it's not clear if they're meant to be directly about the first tweet that started everything, or if it's more of just a general observation of the landscape of the website at that particular time. But whatever it was, it really riled people up. For example, on Boxing Day, an account called Pander Shirts said this, quote, Gen Z both being obsessed with being queer and extremely sex negative is producing hilarious discourse on here. And do you want to bet that people were normal in response to this? Do you? Again, place your bets now. Because of course they weren't. No, they would never ever be normal about this. It's like they were tripping over themselves to be the one to prove his point the hardest. And unlike many internet drama situations where people just claim, oh my gosh, people were so mean to me in my replies without providing any receipts, there was an entire follow-up post with screenshots of replies and quote retweets containing exactly the kind of reactions you'd expect and then some. It got bad, okay? There were things like, we're just saying women shouldn't be abused during sex. Why are you saying we're sex negative because we don't want men to beat us? Why is it sex negative to not want to see someone get effed during a parade. Like really, it, it just goes on and on and on. I could read you these responses for an hour probably and still not be done. As you can see, this became about way more than just consensual non-consent. It eventually became about kink in general because, you know, being beaten is obviously synonymous with all of BDSM ever. There was also a lot of commentary about kink at Pride, and kink in queer spaces, and kink being on social media platforms at all, and vanilla prawn, and erotica, and people were just all talking about all of this all at the same time, and they clearly have very strong feelings about it. And I think it's very telling that for the sake of argument, eventually, CNC came to be equated with female submission and participation in kink in general to a lot of folks. There's no distinction whatsoever between power exchange, bottoming, or full-on consensual non-consent. I did not see a single person say, listen, I defend women participating in consensual kink as much as they want, as long as it's not this particular kink. No, no, no. It was all women who do kink or 99% of the time just doing it because they've been brainwashed into liking it by a man. And that's partly why conversations like this are so concerning, because it's not a narrowly tailored rejection of one teeny little slice of what's possible within BDSM, no. It's equating one thing that they are concerned about with BDSM on the whole, and then they want to throw all of it in the trash off a cliff because they see it as dangerous, aberrant, and a setback for women's liberation and safety. And I don't have to tell you all this, but it is simply not accurate to portray BDSM as boiling down to nothing more than basically being about men who hate women wanting an excuse to beat them. Keep an eye on how often beating them or beating women comes up, by the way. But for the sake of verbalizing it, because I haven't seen anyone else do this, I'll explain why that's not true. Do you know what consistently the most popular topics I get asked about actually are? It's stuff like praise kink, gentle dom, and loving caregiver little or pet play dynamics where the submissive get stickers and forehead kisses and a glass of milk before bed. A very large chunk of people do no impact play whatsoever in their dynamics or punishments. It's all ooey gooey, lovey dovey stuff where the sub feels wanted and cared for and appreciated. But of course, for people who only know about this stuff on a theoretical level, 
it sure seems like it's all about people getting bruised and dragged around by their hair. And even if that was the most popular thing everyone always did in kink, people often ignore who is the instigator of these types of dynamics. It's well known within the community that 90% of the time, it seems like, it's the sub or the masochist asking to play or asking to play harder, often taking their semi-willing dominant partners along with them for the ride. But that won't matter to a lot of these kink critical rad femmes, as I'll call them, because they'll blame that tendency on women being conditioned into desiring these things even if she's begging her partner to give her a loving, soft birthday spanking, that is simply evidence of how deep the cultural brainwashing has gone. She doesn't even realize it's the internalized misogyny talking. But yeah, the point is that not all BDSM is about people punching each other. It can be about dress up and make believe, pleasant sensations and expressing love and devotion in a mutual way. And even those times where kink is about pain and suffering, characterizing it as beating is a little unfair on the whole. There is a world of difference between wailing on someone without regard for their health or safety and precisely delivering intentional sensation only on certain areas of the body that have been agreed on in advance and have been found to produce the most enjoyable feelings for the least amount of risk. But again, the people arguing about this stuff have never seen a BDSM scene in their life most of the time. So how would they actually know? It's most convenient for their argument to paint the picture that kink is about wanton bodily harm rather than precisely controlled, although slightly unusual, pleasurable bodily experiences. But let's get back to talking about where this all started. With CNC, aka consensual non-consent, as I said a couple times now in this video. In the original post, the OP shows someone else saying, beating women until they're sobbing and seems to believe this is implicitly an example of CNC. I'll say that this is not the case. Not all CNC looks like that, and it could just as easily be a plain old directly consensual scene as well. Unfortunately, it does seem like the general public's understanding of CNC is that it's a polite way to refer to our word playing someone, and that's about all it is. And that's a common version of it, which we'll talk about soon, but it's not the only way to do CNC. It's an umbrella label, covering activities where you give consent in advance to act as though your consent has been waived at a later point in time. This includes play that happens during scenes as well as whole relationships. While CNC is usually pictured as a form of extreme resistance play, it doesn't have to be like that. In relationships that have CNC as a foundation, foundational tenant, being forced to eat a cantaloupe could be a form of consensual non-consent, even though it's silly rather than scary, unless you have a cantaloupe phobia, I suppose. No intercourse actually has to be involved at any point in this process. Crying during play doesn't make it a CNC scene either. People have all different kinds of emotional experiences during BDSM play. Tears can be a sign of relief or release, or they can mean nothing at all. I know I cry at the drop of a hat most times while I play. It doesn't necessarily mean anything, and it definitely doesn't mean I'm being treated like the stereotypical woman in an awareness campaign about DV. It's just what my body does when I get a rush of adrenaline. I, I can't really control it. Moreover, people who do CNC don't always cry either. They can laugh, they can giggle, they can scream too. Sometimes people even have fun while they do CNC activities. Shock and horror, I know. And as a side note, this whole thing started a bit of a debate within the BDSM community about the use of safe words within CNC play. Some people think you have to have them even within CNC, and some people say the whole point of CNC is to not use them. And I'm gonna annoy people here, but I do think there's room in the community for both perspectives. And it's a diverse enough label to begin with that it's more about what you want than some absolute truth one way or the other. Do CNC how you want, but 
as I was saying, the conversation online lacked any of this nuance around what CNC is, leading folks to make the same usual blanket statements about how sick it is that people want to pretend to be R-worded, and that engaging with so-called R-word fantasies is wrong, making it seem like this is a rare, dangerous aberration that only occurs thanks to the indoctrination of the patriarchy or prom. But what does the science actually have to say about this? If you've taken a psychology course in the last, let's say, 20 years or so, you likely don't need me to tell you about this, but so-called forced sex fantasies aren't unusual. According to researcher Dr. Justin LaMiller, over 60% of women had fantasized about R-word scenarios before, and nearly a quarter fantasized about it regularly. That is huge. This is so common that it wouldn't be outlandish to suggest that at least some of the people decrying how awful acting on these fantasies are have these fantasies for themselves. And I imagine that could lead to a lot of guilt and shame if being turned on by thoughts like this feels like a betrayal of your values and what you're fighting for. So how do almost a quarter of women return to these fantasies again and again? Lots of reasons are suggested by the research. People with active imaginations tend to fantasize about a wider array of subject matter in general. Other studies have indicated that folks who are turned on by kink activities, like our word play, are turned on more by all forms of prawn, even the simplest vanilla stuff too. Rather than it being a slippery slope of no return, it seems kinky folk just happen to have a more diverse palette. People who are sensation seekers also seem more drawn to this fantasy, due to it being seen as thrilling and risky. Others are drawn to it because they can separate love and copulation. A quick look at some of the most popular tweets about this topic illuminates how this may be the root of the disdain many feel towards our fantasies. While sex can be an expression of love and tenderness, it certainly doesn't have to be nor is that always desirable for the participants involved. The most controversial potential correlation here, though, is with trauma. The OP that kicked off this whole debate did so by snidely referring to folks who call CNC a, a, a coping mechanism? Oh wait, no, I'm sorry, they called it a, a coping machine. You think I didn't notice that? I absolutely did. <laughs> that naturally led to an outcry from folks who do have a history of trauma and find CNC or kink play in general to be helpful. I've certainly seen that in my comment sections and interacting with the BDSM community at large. Lots of people self-report that they find a special solace in getting to play out scenarios that remind them of their past. They often say it lets them re-experience things while maintaining control and fixing a past narrative. But the research isn't quite so definitive about this. It appears that most studies show either a very small correlation with trauma history or, or none at all. Sexual violence is much more common than many think. The CDC, for example, reports that over half of women will experience sexual violence involving physical contact at some point during their lives. I couldn't find an exact data point that correlates with this, but the numbers from the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey get pretty close, reporting that nearly 44% of women have a lifetime prevalence of such contact. That combined with the fact that 60% of women have fantasized about our word scenarios, and it's not hard to see how there may be a big overlap. So I think it's counterproductive to frame these fantasies as though they're incredibly rare or act like only survivors of violence have these fantasies, or indeed that survivors universally find having such fantasies to be disgusting. When over half of women have these fantasies, at least some of the time, you simply are not going to be able to shame people out of ever acting on them. If that is your goal, you would have to have a massive surveillance police state for that to be possible. I don't think most of us want that. But beyond this, there's one more motivation that I see as very important and also very commonly overlooked. Researchers have also noted that folks with lower self-esteem and more attachment anxiety are more likely to report 
our word fantasies. The knee-jerk reaction, I think, is to explain this by saying, ah, see, look, this proves it. People are only into this stuff because they hate themselves and don't think they deserve real happiness. How sad. But I think there's actually a second, more positive way to read this correlation, but it takes knowing what form these fantasies often take to be able to get there. Part of why I consider our fantasy, though I've said it a bunch in this video, to be a misnomer, and prefer to use terms like ravishment fantasy instead, is because the crime this desire is often correlated with has very little resemblance to the fantasy. Often the fantasy involves a narrative of they wanted me so badly they just couldn't help themselves or even though I was saying no, I secretly wanted it or despite the fact I know I shouldn't enjoy it, I secretly do. It's often framed as coming from deep desire and impulse and instinct that someone simply has to have you and won't take no for an answer. For a person with self-esteem issues or attachment issues, what is a more potent balm than a fantasy world where you are ruthlessly, unquestionably desired? Such a fantasy also offers a convenient excuse to avoid feelings of shame or guilt about improper sexual desire. Take, for example, the well-known Christmas song, Baby It's Cold Outside. Maybe that is what sparked this debate over Christmas Eve. The lyrics under a modern lens often provoke disgust, with at least one Twitter or Tumblr post a year proclaiming that it deserves to be indicted, saying that it shows just how sexist and awful the 40s were, and that the woman in the song is clearly being coerced. But a closer reading will reveal something else here. This is instead a representation of the lengths women had to go to to conceal their sexual desire and give themselves plausible deniability. Oh, I didn't want to stay, but you see, I had to. With the snow and the booze and all of that, it's simply not my fault. Willfully staying overnight with a man you weren't married to when your family expected you to be at home would have been a scandal for most families. But if you got simply unlucky and had no choice, who could blame you? Ravishment fantasies can play a similar role, allowing folks to explore desire in a safe framework where they are less likely to be blamed, seen as loose or easy, and so on. And now that we have thoroughly explained everything there is to know about ravishment fantasies and the people who have them, let's go back once again into the fray that is twitter.com. Because laying out all of this research like this it at least makes me scratch my head like, why, why don't you get this? Is it really so hard to understand why people do all this stuff? I mean, look at all the research we have. This is not new information. But if the argument goes on for long enough, the truth has a funny way of revealing itself because it's not about the science. On about day three of this debate, the OP came back with another banger of a tweet. Does the BDSM community who praise women's mission and call it a choice, a consent, instead of solving it and challenging the patriarchy, know that conservatives use their argument to prove the patriarchal myth that men are naturally superior and that women are submissive? Y'all are truly agents of the patriarchy. Firstly, I would love to know what this person's idea of, quote, solving it is. Like, like, if you have one, why don't you share with the class since it's so obvious what the solution to patriarchy is? I think this post is simply quite telling. Women can't submit because that just proves the patriarchy right. This is why the argument about CNC ended up really being about all different forms of BDSM and power exchange because it all does the same thing to them. It cedes territory to the enemy. They believe women are incapable of giving meaningful consent to anything even remotely resembling 
spicy sex because men have controlled womankind for too long and taken that away from them. I mean, the implications of this line of reasoning are just, whew, yeesh. But surely we can't just draw the line here, right? I mean, if we're interested in policing the private sex lives of people we don't know for the sake of solving misogyny and getting rid of the patriarchy, there are so many arguably more visible and impactful things to disavow as well. If we really want to not give them any ammo at all, what about stay-at-home moms or women who have kids at all? Or if they marry a man or if women do more than 51% of the housework, what about the women who don't do any of that but work in women's jobs like being a nurse or a teacher or a librarian? What about women who dress femininely or modestly? Where are we drawing the line? For people who want to double down and maintain moral consistency, this usually ends with the suggestion of political lesbianism and removing all traces of vague traditional femininity from your life or outward appearance. You are no longer allowed to care about any of those things. That didn't have the staying power the last time we suggested it a couple decades ago. So I'm not sure where they think this is going to end up. And one thing here that I have not heard anyone else say is this. Ultimately, Acting like this can be solved on an individual psychological level instead of a societal one is misguided. The problem doesn't originate with individual people. Thinking this way is rather like assuming if everyone just recycled their aluminum cans or aluminium, I'm sorry, we'd meaningfully impact climate change. These problems are systemic and have to be solved on a systemic basis. Books like, for example, Invisible Women are chock full of examples of how everything from car safety regulations to city layouts are done in ways that ignore or disadvantage women. We're not solving the patriarchy via the bedroom. We could outright ban BDSM tomorrow and give people citations for committing fantasy thought crimes, and it wouldn't make a friggin' dent. We've got to think bigger than that, folks. Robust, comprehensive sex ed based on actual science that emphasizes consent would be a fantastic start. We could also think about, I don't know, reforming our criminal justice system, maybe making things like stealthing or cyber stalking and revenge prawn actual crimes. And especially with the impending age of AI and deep fakes, we're gonna need some regulations sooner rather than later. And that's more or less where I want to end things today. Hopefully this made some sense. Actually, I have a video that I got started writing after I made this one that I think will be a really interesting follow-up video because though this segment of Twitter, this like kink critical rad femme part of Twitter is very concerned with like not giving ammo to the enemy and the patriarchal overlords and things, you would be surprised how often they will cite people that you would think they would disagree with more than anything in an effort to discredit kink and to make it sound dangerous. So prepare for that video when that one comes around. I would love to know y'all thoughts about this topic in a comment down below. Did you see this happen over Christmas? Were you on Twitter or are you just hearing about this for the first time? Again, would love to hear your thoughts in a comment down below. If you did enjoy this, you can go ahead and subscribe to my channel. I make videos twice a week about all sorts of different kink and BDSM related topics. And finally, if you wanna support what I do, the best you can do is with Patreon. A link to that will be down below. If you do already support me there, thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And until I see you all next time, I hope you have a great yesterday and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.